Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with Jennifer Morone. She will be speaking about the future of capitalism, but she will be speaking from a very personal perspective uh, and a very political perspective, I think. Uh, she uh, incorporated herself. Uh, Jennifer became a company, not publicly listed yet. If there's an IPO, you'll be able to buy a share. Uh, but she is a company, and I think the idea, she'll tell us better, is that you have to be a company to uh, survive and thrive in today's capitalism. She's been working with a foundation and a movement, Radical Exchange, and around Jennifer, the company, a whole ecosystem has been developing and building. Uh, there's no better way to uh, look at that fascinating project and the way it's been uh, uh, turning out than to uh, see this presentation that uh, Jennifer is going to be leading, and then we'll be back here for questions. Jennifer. Thank you, Bruno, and thank you for coming, and for, I'm very happy to be here. So I'd like to start with a little scope of what everybody thinks. How, how many people here like to work for free? How many people like to get paid for the work that you do? Uh, yeah. oh, that's not even half. <laughs> surprising. Well, actually, we're all already working for free. Every day, you create value in your lives for some of the biggest tech companies in the world, and they're becoming monopolies. Now, if you were here back in 2011 at the World Economic Forum, or even read their report, you would have likely heard of this issue, um, which they said was the digital economy and the new asset is the personal data. And the problem was identified back then that you have these contributors and you have the people that want the data and who sits in the middle but the companies. And they create <clears throat> excuse me, um, products and services that have become less and less of value to capture our data. And then they sell those in other products to their true customers. And so when I heard about this and when Snowden came out with his revelations, I was quite disturbed. And so I did an artistic gesture as a reaction. Oops, sorry. We are all data slaves. I don't know about you, but I've had enough of being exploited. You know who's got it made? Corporations. If companies can make money from my information, information that I generate just by being alive, then so can I. I've decided to play their game, but with a little twist, by bringing the whole process down to the individual by incorporating my identity. So my solution was to create a legal container that I could then try to collect and control my personal information from. And so I looked at the ways in which I, I emanated data, all the ways, and I went as far as I could to collect it. Here's just 25 data points showing the blinking red light is uh, the heart rate. And it shows everything that you can collect just from a phone and maybe a, a Fitbit or something like that. And so that allowed me to try and do that, but also try to bring it to the market. So I cut it up into the categories that I saw we were being cut up into. But this was my provocation. This was a protest. It wasn't that this is where I think we should go. I was trying to say there's a value we're all creating. And is this where we want to go? Where do we want to go? And so I started to think of alternatives, because any protest needs a solution or demand. And I was thinking, well, if everybody had to become a personal corporation, uh, we need something more collective, a collective data broker and data unions. And eventually, five years later, this thinking brought me to meet other people such as Glenn Weil, who wrote the book Radical Markets and founded Radical Exchange. And together, we have been thinking about what these ideas would look like. And with many others, we want to move beyond critiquing to actual alternatives. And the ideas I'm going to present here, there are two of them. So one will continue with data. And then I'm also going to talk about voting. 
But there are ideas that we don't think that they're exactly those that need to be implemented, but that hold a sense of the broader principles that we could implement. So we see data as what is created by us. It's life. And there are uniquely forming patterns of social commitments that we create through the variety of communities that we take part in. And this weaves this web of social data that is vibrant and expanding and could be so much more if there was a different structure. So one part of a data-dignified world is where this new type of institution, so you still have a similar structure, but at the top you have what we call MIDs, mediators of individual data. And instead of these being for-profit companies, or they could be profit companies, but they act like fiduciaries on the behalf of people where they can collectively bargain for us and sell our data that we deem is okay to sell, that we agree and we decide, and that money and services come back to us and it creates more of a closed loop system. Now to illustrate this further, I'd like to give an example of Jane. Jane belongs to several mids. There's a music mid, a cooking mid, an energy mid, and a health data mid. With the music mid, she is a musician, and so it's something like Spotify, but she actually is a member of it. It's not a, a C corporation or a private company. And so she makes music, she receives some income from that, and there are listeners who pay a subscription but also receive some income from their data analysis. And then there are programmers that keep developing the platform. Then she's, when she's cooking, she has some bots and technology in the environment. And she, it's kind of like having a child in the room, in the kitchen with her, where she's teaching it what she's doing, what ingredients are, and what what are the methods that we, we eat and cook. Now I want to move on to another idea. This is the second idea of voting. When we have large populations like we have, especially in China, um, with many different interests, one person, one vote starts to break down. And so we're working on this idea that comes from, again, Glenn Weil, who wrote a paper back in 2014 with Eric Posner. And more recently, we've been working with Santiago Siri of Democracy Earth to create an interface. And it's called quadratic voting. And how it works is instead of having one person, one vote, you get a number of credits. So say you get 100 credits and you have 10 decisions um, to vote on. Every vote, every credit, Every vote is a quadratic cost of the credits. So if you have one vote, you spend one token. If you want to vote twice on something, the same thing, you have to spend four. And if you want to vote three times, you have to spend nine credits. And what's really important is that it, it slows you down. It slows the process down. It makes you think about what really matters, because if you want to yell as much as you want around one issue, you can do that, but it's going to cost you. And you're, it's not going to matter as much. So it's to incentivize spreading out what you care about. And it was used recently in Colorado. Uh, the legislature, the Democratic legislature, used it to vote on their spending bill, which they had $40 million to spend on 100, $120 million in requests. So they were also voting anonymously and privately, and they received more nuance in what people felt. And the representative said there was better signal with less noise, and they were able to capture people's intensity on what mattered to them. So now again, these are just a couple of the ideas and designs. And like I said earlier, it's not exactly about these designs. These are ways to start getting you to think broadly, move past the problems, move past the critiquing, and going over and over again, and thinking about alternatives. Um, some of the other ideas that we're working on relate to moving beyond private property to diversely shared property, to a novel approach with public funding, again, a quadratic way of finance, and other means of increasing human um, 
increasing returns for fair, efficient, and complex waste. And we aren't the only ones hungry for change. Just in a year, we have 150 chapters around the world. There's a few starting in, in China just this week. And together, they're committed to embracing markets and technology to build bold visions that reflect our diversely shared lives. And we believe that together we can be more prosperous and things can be more efficient and that we could grow our cooperative society. So I want to end this on a deep Chinese uh, philosopher's words that capture a bit the spirit of what we believe. I don't know how to say this in Chinese, I'm sorry. <laughs> Xi Ling Zhang is the philosopher. And so this is close. This is open. Together they make flapping wings. And lead, these two together are leads to change. So like the Chinese culture that the interaction of the yin, the moon, and the yang, the, the sun, the dong, which is motion, and Jing, motionless, are the push and pull that create new things. And this is what we are striving for. Thank you very much. Well, I'm hoping we'll see some flapping of wings now between the audience and Jennifer. Questions, comments? Who wants to start? Hi there. Hi. Um, I had a question. A lot of the people that I hear on my internet feed who are upset with capitalism are extremely emotional about it. Yeah. Uh, and there are some people who are willing to sit down and kind of think out a complicated formula for how to fix these problems. A lot of people want to bash the whole system to, to pieces. Yeah. Um, what sort of uh, ideas do you have for sort of bringing, I don't know if bringing together is the right way or how to deal with the amount of emotion that comes in from some people on this issue, but also trying to use it for a good outcome at the end? Yeah, well, we're actually, um, with Radical Exchange, we bring together various groups. So we have activists in government, policymakers, um, people from entrepreneurship and tech, artists, as well in communicators and people in academia. And they, they're across the political spectrum. And they, they vary in their, you know, I'm maybe more on the left than others are more on the right and libertarian. And we don't talk really about politics, though. We don't talk in that way. We talk about what we fear. We talk about what we want. And we talk about logical ways to, to move forward, but also with that's why the arts is very important, with um, a sensitivity and still that critique, critical nature of well, we can't just implement something, because then that does create a feeling of blowing it up if it's just going to be a technological solution. We feel like it really needs to be, we're all together, we're all here together at this moment, and we need to work together. So I think that since we lead with people, and we don't lead with technology as a solution, that I think that creates that, and by being so inclusive, um, that also helps. Thank you. You started by, we start by discussing who would like to, or who want to work with, without being paid. And it seems as we were unanimous to say that we would like to be paid for what we are doing. Yeah. And we know by history that women have been doing a lot to support the capitalism for free. Yeah. How do you integrate this in your system? Because all the care work around the world, all the bringing up the family, etc., is a huge work, yeah. unpaid work. Mm -hmm. So how you know, do yeah. you integrate that? No, precisely. A lot of the work. Um, that is done and highly paid is actually not very useful. Uh, people like mothers and even cleaners should be paid more. And if, if there's something like universal basic income or something like where people get data dividends, the work that people don't need to do will drop and the work that's more valued will be supported. 
I also took care of my mother when she was dying. And that's not anything comparable to, I think, child raising, but it's another thing that I think um, needs to be valued. So we don't have a price, and I don't know if we should move to a price base of these, these functions of society, but acknowledging them and treating them as just as important or more important um, than a lot of jobs that we spend our times doing. So that is coupled with automation then and moving towards a future where we have to redistribute the value that's being gained and being concentrated. And so those are mechanisms. I don't have the exact one, but data as labor is what we were calling it, but data dignity is one of the ways to try and redistribute that value. Um, the private property that I said, like a different kinds of taxation, harbinger taxation, where there's self-assessment on property. Um, if you self-assess too high, it goes into a higher tax that you have to pay that goes back to the community. So there's value constantly being generated. It's just being concentrated. And breaking that back up and sharing it, um, I think, is, is how we support those roles. Does that answer? Hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, two questions. Uh, you, you talk about the quadratic, uh, the exponential, the more geogran geometrical way to, to have more intensity, less noise. Is there really data backing up that it's this square formula who works well? That's one question. And secondly, one of the most fundamental issues we have right now is those who feel disenfranchised don't vote. Isn't there a risk? Don't vote. Don't vote. They don't participate. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a risk? that by doing that, you're actually just increasing those who are either angry or who want to hack the system. I mean, I know in Europe, for example, the participation rate is what is going to be correlated to the rate of extreme right. If there's a lot of participation, goes down. Yeah. If it's uh, or less participation, you have higher extremes. Yeah. Is that really solving that? Is there some data backing it up? It sounds very attractive, but how much data is behind it? I guess part of the importance is to activate people to become participants and to build ways that the ideas, the push is coming from the bottom up instead of the top down. So we're also working with the chapters, creating an infrastructure so that they can actually, the ideas come from below and that their voices, they're the ones working on it and to kind of diminish the state as much as possible. There is um, statistics research backing up that, and I didn't show the diagram, but what you have with one person, one vote, or some other ones is it creates this U, or W. Um, so you have the extremes, which might be leading to a lot of the problems we have now. And then with quadratic voting, you just had more of a wave. So you couldn't use it really, I think, for, it wouldn't be the right solution for a two-person election, but for, do you support gun rights or do you want to keep abortion? You know, these kinds of things it would be able to show. People might feel like their voices are heard more as well. So again, like I said, the ideas are to, meant to be pushed forward. They're not implemented and to be tested and tried and, and developed further. But it's the, the principles of making people active participants together for a society that we share. It's, it would be interesting if some of you actually want to uh, defend the data economy as it exists now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that would be interesting to see uh, your question. So don't be shy. Uh, there's a question here. So uh, I, I work in politics, so I'm interested in your, your idea around quadratic voting. and. Um, my, my concern with it is that I think actually we have some version of it right now and it's actually to blame uh, for, for a lot of the um, inability to get things done. So mm. to use your two examples of gun rights and abortion, mm -hmm. where I'd say we have what you're talking about is that um, and the NRA and Planned Parenthood, for, just to give examples on one side respectively these two issues, actually serve as amplifiers for those who feel intensely about, a about those respective issues, where your speech is magnified through your donations to these organizations. Labor unions are the same way, corporations, 
play a similar role in politics through, mm -hmm. through, again, through fundraising. The problem with that, though, is that there seems to be kind of perfect alignment between intensity of feeling and a kind of irreconcilable position on a certain thing, so that 80% of Americans want common sense gun laws, but the 20% who feel very, very strongly about not having any of those things have been able to amplify their voice in, in a way that I think is kind of analogous to what you're suggesting through voting, but they do it through donations. So how do you, how do you make sure that you're not actually making the, the challenge of extremism even worse? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I personally think that there should be a cap um, and that, well, these votes, these credits should, are meant to be non-fungible, so you can't trade them, you can't collect them or hoard them either. Um, because if you have a, an election for gun laws every few years and you save them, then... So with what you're... Do you still have the microphone if I have a conversation? With what you're saying, um, how, how is it that... So there are 80%, you said, in the same population that are voting on the same thing? So, so like, so let's say 80% of Americans think that there ought to be common sense gun safety yeah. laws. But it's like not their number one issue, they're maybe their primary, take a suburban mom, okay. right? She, she cares about a lot of different things. But if you were to ask her, do you think we ought to have background checks, she'd say yeah. <laughs> but, but the thing is, she's not donating, right, like to a cause. The people who don't want any gun restrictions are gonna give $100 yeah. to the NRA, that money then amplifies right mm -hmm. their, their voice structurally through the organization. Same with like a teachers union. A lot of parents may want a different policy, but the teachers through collective donations to their PAC are able to get uh, their agenda push. And the problem then is that that then doesn't align with a moderating, compromising position because the organization's willing to 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 kind of collect and compound that political interest are the ones who have the least interest in that issue being resolved mm -hmm. because their actual, their, their sustainability as an organization relies on the conflict. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer. I think that's something that needs to be tested out. I don't know if it's about adding, figuring out what the other issues those people care about and put, placing them next to the vote. Um, but that's, that's, one thing that we, we say, it might not be perfect for that, like those two comparisons, having moms and gun laws, but what other ones can you put in there? And what, how, how can you, doesn't need to be much more local and then like compiled or, I think the national level is probably not the best way to take that vote. Um, and you know, who are most affected at the moment in the pu public sphere are children are very worried about going to school. So how do you, how do you say, you know, if you want more funding for your child's school, but you want them to be safe in school? So I don't know. I think in, in America we're at, it would have to be tested, I think. Hi, I want to go back to the data question. So you started the presentation talking about how we're all working for free, you know, for companies like Facebook and Google, who yeah. generate a lot of revenue off of our data. Um, so would you agree that the, the dominance of companies like, like those two are a sign of capitalism gone wrong? And another question is, how do we gain ownership of our data? Uh, or, or win it back? Do we just withdraw from the system and just kind of delete all our social accounts? Uh, what's your view? Um, I think that there's a combination of policy and, um, yeah, like a limitation on what these companies can do. Uh, with the new institution, like cooperatives or data cooperatives that would act like fiduciaries, you know, before the financial planners could do what they want until there were regulations put in place or a system that they had to act on 
people's best interest. Now we have a choice of whether we choose to go to one of them or not. But <coughs> so, <coughs> I'm sorry. I think Google and Facebook are a sign of capitalism gone wrong. Um, I think, again, it's just like when there were the rubber barons and we had to break them up. Um, and they're holding on to dear life for you know, the model that exists. And if we go further, they, they are getting prepared to start paying us a little dividend here and there. But I, I don't think that's the right way forward in terms of us all being on welfare to Facebook or Google or, you know, are they going to become nations? Um, and looking at the havoc that's been caused, particularly by Facebook, I think there's too much susceptibility to being manipulated or um, not our best interest when you have shareholders. We, we have another question here, but let me just ask a quick question because I think we understand the quadratic voting very well by now, mm -hmm. but how about the uh, mediators of, of individual data? Mm -hmm. How would it work in practice? Do they sell the data that, that, that people provide? Do they use it? Do they distribute a dividend? after using it? Can you describe quickly how, yeah. how you see that work? Well, there are different mechanisms for different types of data and how that would be structured. So for the example of health that I didn't go into, maybe that would be you hold your data and you commit it, or the, the MID holds the health data for a certain community. And it could be a local community. It could be a community of people with the same uh, genetic mutation. It could be my parent was sick with this, so I'm also, and you know, all of this information already goes to researchers, and then those, that goes to pharmaceutical companies. So there's this transaction happening. All it would be is that this mid would be the only one to maybe sell the data. But they can't sell it unless the members that belong to the data, that belong to the mid, grant permission that it can. So you're, you're in this relationship as a participant in this greater economy, and you have a say in what is being sold, what is not, and how it is, and what it goes to. So it might still end up with the pharmaceutical company, but maybe that mechanism would be that you're paid, or that health services are paid, or that people receive royalties if, you know, then you have to get into patents, which is another way, idea with the private property of um, breaking into that as well. So... One question here, and then we'll have time for one or two more. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a global shaper. My name is Alicia. I'm from Italy. Yeah. Um, but I live and work in China, so I've seen how uh, a democracy or a, a more... Um, uh, top-down society work in different ways yeah. and um, I think I have a voice because I, I belong to communities like the Global Shapers but most of the people in my generation don't and what I've been thinking about is that um, when we mm, have like social media or we have uh, big corporations and governments they all give an opinion to people rather than listening to people mm -hmm. so if we, if we have a way to let the people communicate with us, it's usually through a complaint. Uh, it's either like uh, protesting in the streets or complaining on the website and I make it hard for you to complain. Or like on social media, we see like the biggest threats are like always like very hasty complaints, right? So, but I think as the, the, people, the thing that people naturally do is communicate with each other to form opinions. Yeah. And a lot of people feel they don't have a voice in capitalism because... Uh, as a design researcher, I've done this, I've, I've been interviewed people and they're like, oh yeah, I use this, but I don't really need it. Or like, I use this, this is the only thing I can buy. Or I have this government and I don't really, they don't, I, I don't understand if there's a way to, uh, instead of like even like monetize, monetizing on the data that we give to this company, is there a way to engage in more proactively the people so that they feel that they cannot only just give their opinion when they have to complain, but give their opinion when they want to propose something. Mm -hmm. Um, I yeah, I think that's definitely something that we should be building. Um, and I don't think enough space for that exists, and we have to create it. So that's 
that's one thing that we're trying to do, like I said, with the chapters and building that infrastructure for the voices to be heard. And then also it's more local government connecting them so that they, the government goes to work with these communities. Um, but when it's such a big level, like national level, and the companies as well, I agree, it's not, we don't have that way, and that's something that we really need to create. So I hope. We're running out of time, a, a very quick question, Jennifer. People try to find a word to define data. Some people say it's oil, some people say it's capital, some people say labor. What, what is your word? If you want a synonym of data in today's economy, what word would you pick? Just one word. Well, we say labor, but more of the Hannah Arendt version of labor, that it's human activity and that is separate from work. Some of it is work, some of it is, can be capital when it's generated by a company itself. Some of it is more like resources that flow, but we think of it as labor. Thank you very much. Fascinating discussion. Uh, I think Jennifer was going to be here for a few minutes to talk to people. Thank you for coming and have a good day.